Hello, my name is V. Hongo, and today I'm going to do a read through of Death of a Salesman by Arthur Miller. Arthur Miller was an American uh, writer. He was born in 1915 in New York City, and he died in 2005. Uh, Death of a Salesman is, is his second play, uh, the first one being All My Sons, 1947. And then Death of a Salesman, 1949. And then he has some other credentials as well. Cast in order of appearance, Death of a Salesman. Uh, we have Willie Loman, Linda, Biff, Happy, Bernard, The Woman, Charlie, Uncle Ben, Howard Wagner, Jenny, Stanley, Miss Forsyth, and Letta. And then I think there's also a girl at some point, but I'm not sure how she plays in. I've never read this before, so this is my first time. It is a play of two acts, followed by a short requiem. And uh, the action takes place in William Loman's house and yard, and the various places he visits in the New York and Boston of today. So let's begin. Act 1. A melody is heard, played upon a flute. It is small and fine, telling of grass and trees and the horizon. The curtain rises. Before us is the salesman's house. We are aware of towering angular shapes behind it, surrounding it on all sides. Only the blue light of the sky falls upon the house and forestage. The surrounding area shows an angry glow of orange. As more light appears, we see a solid vault of apartment houses around the small, fragile-seeming home. An air on the dream clings to the place, a dream rising out of reality. The kitchen at center seems actual enough, for there is the kitchen table with three chairs and a refrigerator. Other fixtures are seen. At the back of the kitchen, there is a draped entrance, which leads to the living room. To the right of the kitchen, on a level raised two feet, is a bedroom furnished only with a brass bedstand and a straight chair. On a shelf over the bed, a slight, uh, a silver athletic trophy stands. A window opens onto the apartment house at the side. Behind the kitchen, on a level raised six and a half feet, is the boys' room, at present barely visible. Two beds are dimly seen, and at the back of the room, a dormer window. This bedroom is above the unseen living room. At the left, a stairway curves up to it from the kitchen. The entire setting is wholly, or in some places, partially transparent. The roof line of the house is one-dimensional. Under and over it, we see the apartment buildings. Before the house lies an apron, curving beyond the forestage into the orchestra. This forward area serves as the backyard as well as the locale of all Willie's imaginings and of his city scene. is in the room, imaginary wall lines entering the house at the left but in the scenes of the past these boundaries are broken and characters uh, enter or leave the room by stepping through a wall onto the fourth stage from the right willie loman the salesman enters carrying two large sample cases the flute plays on he hears but is not aware of it he is he is past 60 years of age dressed quietly even as he crosses the stage to the doorway of the house, his exhaustion is apparent. He unlocks the door, comes into the kitchen, and thankfully lets his burden down, feeling the soreness of his palms. A word sigh escapes his lips. It might be, oh boy, oh boy. He closes the door, then carries his cases out into the living room through the draped kitchen doorway. Linda, his wife, has stirred in her bed at the right. She gets out and puts on a robe listening. Most often jovial, she has developed an iron repression of her exceptions to Willie's behavior, and more than loves him, she admires him as though his mercurial nature, his temper, his massive dreams, and little cruelties served her only as sharp reminders of the turbulent longings within him, longings which she shares but lacks the temperament to utter and follow to their end. Linda, hearing Willie outside the bedroom, calls with some trepidation. Willie! Willie, it's all right. I came back. Why? What happened? Slight pause. She, did something happen, Willie? 
No, nothing happened. You didn't smash the car, did you? Willie, with casual irritation. I said nothing happened. Didn't you hear me? Don't you feel well? I'm tired to the death. The flu has faded away. He sits on the chair beside her, a little numb. I couldn't make it. I just couldn't make it, Linda. Linda, very carefully, delicately. Where were you all day? You look terrible. I got as far as little above Yonkers. I stopped for a cup of coffee. Maybe it was the coffee. What? After a pause. I suddenly couldn't drive anymore. The car kept going off uh, onto the shoulder, you know. Oh, maybe it was the steering again. I don't think Angelo knows the Studebaker. No, it's me. It's me. Suddenly, I realize I'm going 60 miles an hour, and I don't remember the last five minutes. I'm, I can't seem to keep my mind to it. Maybe it's your glasses. You never went for your new glasses. No, I see everything. I came back 10 miles an hour. It took me nearly four hours from Yonkers. Well, let's just have... Well, you'll just have to take a rest, Willie, and you can't continue this way. I just got back from Florida. But you didn't rest your mind. Your mind is overactive, and the mind is what counts, dear. I'll start out in the morning. Maybe I'll feel better in the morning. She's taking off his shoes. These goddamn art supports are killing me. Take an aspirin. Should I get you an aspirin? It'll soothe you. I was driving along, you understand. And I was fine. I was even observing the scenery. You can imagine me looking at scenery on the road every week of my life. But it's so beautiful up there, Linda. The trees are so thick and the sun is warm. I'm open, I open the windshield and just let the warm air bathe over me. Then all of a sudden, I'm going off the road. I'm telling you, I absolutely forgot I was driving. It, I've, if I'd have gone the other way over the white line, I might have killed somebody. So I went on again, and five minutes later, I'm dreaming again. And I nearly... He pressed his two fingers against his eyes. I have such thoughts. I have such strange thoughts. Willie, dear, talk to them again. There's no reason why you can't work in New York. They don't need me in New York. I'm the New England man. I'm vital in... But you're 60 years old. You can't expect you to keep traveling every week. I'll have to send a wire to Portland. I'm supposed to see Brown and Morrison tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock to show me the line. Goodness knows it. I, sh I could sell them. He starts putting on his jacket. Linda taking the jacket from him. Why don't you go down to the place tomorrow and tell Howard you've simply got to work in New York? You're too accommodating, dear. If old man Wagner was alive, I'd have been in charge of New York now. That man was a prince. He was a masterful man. But that boy of his, that Howard, he don't appreciate when I went north the first time, the Wagner Company didn't know where New England was. Why don't you tell those things to Howard, dear? I will. I definitely will. Is there any cheese? I'll make you a sandwich. No. Go to sleep. I'll take some milk. I'll be up right away. The boys in? They're sleeping. Happy I took Biff on a date tonight. Hmm, that's so. It was so nice to see them shaving together one behind the other in the bathroom and going out together, you noticed the whole house smells of shaving lotion. Figure it out. Work a lifetime to pay off a house. You finally own it, and there's nobody to live in it. Well, dear, life is a casting off. It's always that way. No, no. Some people. Some people accomplish something. Did Biff say anything after I went this morning? You shouldn't have criticized him, Willie, especially after he just got off the train. You mustn't lose your temper with him. When the hell do I lose my temper? I simply asked him if he was making any money. Is that a criticism? But dear, how could he make any money? Willie, worried and angry. There's such an undercurrent in him. He became a moody man. Did he apologize when I left this morning? He was crestfallen, Willie. You know how he admires you. I think he finds himself. Then you'll both be happier and not fight anymore. How can he find himself on a farm? Is that a life? A farmhand? In the beginning, when he was young, I thought, well, a young man, it's good for him to tramp around. Take a lot of different jobs. But it's more than 10 years now, and he has yet to make $35 a week. He's finding himself, Willie. Not finding yourself at the age of 34 is a disgrace. Shh. The trouble is, he's lazy. Goodness knows it. 
Lily, please. Biff is a lazy bum. They're sleeping. Get something to eat. Go on down. Why did he come home? I would like to know what brought him home. I don't know. I think he's still lost, Willie. I think he's very lost. Biff Loman is lost. In a great country in the world, a young man with such personal attractiveness gets lost. It's such a hard worker. There is one thing about Biff. He's not lazy. Never. I'll see him in the morning. I'll have a nice talk with him. I'll get him a job selling. He could be big in no time. My goodness, remember how they used to follow him around in high school when he smiled at one of their faces lit up when he walked down the street? He loses himself. He loses himself in reminiscences. In reminiscences. Linda, trying to bring him out of it. Lily, dear, I got a new kind of American-type cheese today. It's whipped. Why do you get American when I like Swiss? I just thought you'd like a change. I don't want change. I want Swiss cheese. Why am I always being contradicted? Linda, with a covering laugh. I thought it would be a surprise. Why don't you open a window in here, for goodness sake? Linda, with infinite patience. They're all open, dear. The way they're boxed us in here. Bricks and windows, windows and bricks. We should have bought the land next door. The street is lined with cars. There's not a breath of fresh air in the neighborhood. The grass don't grow anymore. You can't raise a carrot in the backyard. You should have had a law against apartment houses. Remember these two beautiful elm trees out there? When I and Biff hung the swing between them? Yeah, like a million miles from the city. They should have arrested the builder for cutting those down. They massacred the neighborhood. Lost. More and more I think of those days, Linda. This time of year, it was lilac and wisteria, and then the peonies would come out and the daffodils. What fragrance in this room. Well, after all, people had to move somewhere. No, there's more people now. I don't think there's more people. I think there's more people. That's what's ruining this country. Population is getting out of control. The competition is maddening. Smell the stink from the apartment house and another one on the other side. How can they whip cheese? On Willie's last line, Biff and Happy raised themselves up in their beds, listening. Go down, try it, and be quiet. Willie, turning to Linda guiltily. You're not worried about me, are you, sweetheart? Biff, what's the matter? Happy, listen. Linda, you've got too much in the ball to worry about. Willie, you're my foundation of my support, Linda. Linda, just try to relax, dear. You make mountains out of molehills. Won't fight with him anymore. If he wants to go back to Texas, let him go. He'll find a way. Sure, certain men just don't get started till later in life. Like Thomas Edison, I think. Or B.F. Goodrich. One of them was deaf. He starts for the bedroom doorway. I'll put my money on Biff. And Willie, if it's warm Sunday, we'll drive in the country and we'll open the windshield and take lunch. No, the windshields won't open on the new cars. But you opened it today. Me? I didn't. Stops. Now isn't that peculiar? Isn't that a remarkable? Breaks off in amazement and frights as the flute is heard distantly. What, darling? That is the most remarkable thing. What, dear? I was thinking of the Chevy. Slight pause. 1928. When I had that red Chevy. Breaks off. That funny? I could have sworn I was driving that Chevy today. Well, that's nothing. Something must have reminded you. Remarkable. Tis. Remember those days? The way Biff used to simonize that car? The dealer refused to believe there was 80,000 miles on it. <sighs> Close your eyes. I'll be right up. He walks out of the bedroom. Jesus, he's messed up the car again? Linda, calling after Willie. Be careful on the stairs, dear. The cheese is on the metal shelf. She turns, goes over to the bed, takes his jacket, and goes out of the bedroom. Light has risen on the boy's room. Unseen, Willie is heard talking to himself. 80,000 miles. And a little laugh. Biff gets out of bed, comes down stage a bit, and stands attentively. Biff is two years older than his brother, Happy. Well built. But in these Days, words a war has succeeded less, and his dreams are stronger and less acceptable than Happy's. Happy is tall, 
powerfully made. Sexuality is like a visible color on him, or a scent that many women have discovered. He, like his brother, is lost, but in a different way, for he has never allowed himself to turn his face toward defeat, and is thus more confused and hard-skinned, although seemingly more content. Happy, getting out of bed. He's going to get his license taken away if he keeps that up. I'm getting nervous about him, you know, Biff? His eyes are going. No, I'm driven with him. He sees all right. He just doesn't keep his mind on it. I drove him to the city with him last week. He stops at a green light, and then it turns red, and he goes, <laughs> Maybe he's colorblind. Pop? Why, he's got the finest eye for color in the business. You know that. Biff, sitting in his own bed. I'm going to sleep. You're still not sour on Dad, are you, Biff? He's all right, I guess. Lily, underneath them, in the living room. Yes, sir. 80,000 miles. 82,000. You're smoking? Happy, holding out a pack of cigarettes. Want one? Biff, taking a cigarette. I can never sleep when I smell it. Willie, what a si simonizing job, eh? Happy, with deep sentiment. Funny, Biff, you know, us sleeping in here again, the old bed. He pats his bed affectionately. All the talk that went across these two beds, huh? Our whole lives? Yeah, a lot of dreams of bland. Happy, with a deep and masculine laugh. <laughs> About 500 women would like to know what was said in this room. They share a soft laugh. Biff. Remember that big Betsy something? What the heck was her name? Over on Bushwick Avenue? Happy, combing his hair. With the collie dog? That's the one. I got you in there, remember? Yeah, that was my first time, I think. Boy, there was a pig. <laughs> they laugh almost crudely. You taught me everything I know about women. Don't forget that. I bet. You forgot how bashful you used to be, especially with girls. Oh, I am, Biff. I still am, Biff. Oh, go on. I just control it, that's all. I think I got less bashful and you got more so. What happened, Biff? Where's the old humor? The old confidence? He shakes Biff's knee. Biff gets up and moves restlessly around the room. What's the matter? Why does Dad mock me all the time? He's not mocking you. He... Everything I say, there's a twist of mockery on his face. I can't get near him. He just wants you to make good, that's all. I wanted to talk to you about Dad for a long time, Biff. Something happening to him. He talks to himself. I noticed that this morning, but he always mumbled. But not so noticeable. It got so embarrassing, I sent him to Florida. And you know something? Most of the time, he's talking to you. What's he say about me? I can't make it out. What's he say about me? I think the fact that you're not settled, that you're still kind of up in the air. There's one or two other things depressing him, Happy. What do you mean? Never mind. Just lay down. Lay it all to me. But I think you just got started. I mean, is there any future for you out there? I tell you, Hap, I don't know what the future is. I don't know what I'm supposed to want. What do you mean? Well, I spent six or seven years after high school trying to work myself up. Shipping clerk, salesman, business of one kind or another. And it's a measly manner of existence. To get on that subway on the hot mornings in summer, to devote your whole life to keeping stock or making phone calls or selling or buying. <clears throat> to suffer 50 weeks of the year for the sake of a two-week vacation when all you really desire is to be outdoors with your shirt off, and always to have to get ahead of the next fella, and still, that's how you build a future. Well, you really enjoy it on the farm. Are you content out there? Biff, with rising agitation. Ha! I've had 20 or 30 different kinds of jobs since I left home before the war, and it always turns out the same. I just realized it lately. In Nebraska, when I herded cattle in the Dakotas, in Arizona, and now in Texas, it's why I came home now, I guess, because I realized it. 
this farm I work on, it's spring there now, see? And they've got about 15 new colts. There's nothing more inspiring or beautiful than the sight of a mare and a new colt. And it's cool there now, see? Texas is cool now, and it's spring. Whenever spring comes to where I am, I suddenly get the feeling, my God, I'm not getting anywhere. What the heck am I doing, playing around with horses $28 a week? I'm 34 years old. I ought to be making my future. That's when I can't come running home. And now I get here, and I don't know what to do with myself. I've always made a point of not wasting my life. And every time I come back here, I know that all I've done is to waste my life. You're a poet. You know that, dude? You're, a, you're an idealist. No, I'm mixed up very bad. Maybe I ought to get married. Maybe I ought to get stuck into something. Maybe that's my trouble. I'm like a boy. I'm not married. I'm not in business. I just, I'm like a boy. Are you content, Hap? You're a success, aren't you? Are you content? Heck no! Why? You're making money, aren't you? Happy, moving about with energy, expressiveness. All I can do now is wait for the merchandise manager to die. And suppose I get to be merchandise manager. He's a good friend of mine, and he just built a terrific estate on Long Island. And he lived there about two months and sold it, and then he's building another one. He can't enjoy it once it's finished, and I know that's just what I would do. I don't know what the heck I'm working for. Sometimes I sit in my apartment, all alone, and I think of the rent I'm paying. It's crazy, but then it's what I always wanted. My own apartment, a car, plenty of women, and still goodness knows it. I'm lonely. Biff, with enthusiasm. Listen, why don't you come out west with me? You and I, eh? Sure. Maybe we could buy a ranch, raise cattle, use our muscle. Men built like we are should be working in the open. Happy, happily. The Loman Brothers, eh? Biff, with vast affection. Sure. We'd be known all over the country. County. Happy and thrilled. That's what I dream about, Biff. Sometimes I just want to rip my clothes off in the middle of the store and outbox that goodness merchandise manager. I mean, I can outbox, outrun, and outlift anybody in that store. I have to take orders from those common, petty SOBs till I can't stand it anymore. I'm telling you, kid, if you were with me, I'd be happy out there. Happy and serious. See, you, Biff? Everybody around me is so false that I'm constantly lowering my ideals. Baby, together we'd stand up for one another. We'd have someone to trust. If I were around you, ha, the trouble is we weren't brought up to grub for money. I don't know what how to do it. Neither can I. Then let's go. The only thing is, what can you make out there? But look at your friend. Built an estate and then hasn't the peace of mind to live in it. Yeah, but when he walks into the store, the waves part in front of him. That's fifty-two thousand dollars a year coming through the revolving door. And I in my pinky finger, then he's got it in his head. Yeah, but you just said I gotta show some of those pompous, self-important executives over there that Hap Loman can make the grade. I wanna walk into that store the way he walked in. Then I'll go with you, Biff. We'll be together yet. I swear. But take those two we had tonight. Gorgeous creek. Yeah, yeah, most gorgeous I've had in years. I get that anytime I want. I feel just bullying or something. I just keep knocking them over and it doesn't mean anything. You still run around a lot? Close that so it doesn't keep beeping at me. Yeah. Happy. You still run around a lot? Yeah. Nah. I like to find a girl. Steady. Somebody with substance. Happy. That's what I long for. Biff. Go on. You'd never come home. I would. Somebody with character. With resistance. Like mom, you know? You're going to call me a... You're going to call me a bastard when I tell you this. That girl Charlotte, 
I was with tonight is engaged to be married in five weeks. He tries on his new hat. No kidding! Happy. Sure, the guy's in line for some vice presidency of the store. I don't know what gets into me. Maybe I just have an overdeveloped sense of competition or something. But I went and ruined her. And furthermore, I can't get rid of her. But he's the third executive I've done that to. Isn't that a crummy characteristic? It's a top at all. I go to their weddings. Indignantly laughing. Like I'm not supposed to take bribes. Manufacturers offer me a hundred dollar bill now and then to throw an order their way. You know how honest I am? But it's like this girl, see? I hate myself for it because I don't want the girl and still I take it and I love it. Let's go to sleep. I guess we didn't settle anything, hey? I just got one idea that I think I'm gonna try. What's that? Remember Bill Olivier? Bill Oliver? Sure, Oliver. Is very big now. You want to work for him again? No. Oh, but when I quit, he said something to me. He put his arm around my shoulder and said, Biff, if you ever need anything, come. I remember that. That sounds good. I think I'll go to him. If I could get 10000 or even seven or $8,000, I could buy a beautiful ranch. I bet he'd back you because he thought highly of you, Biff. I mean, they all do. You're well liked, Biff. That's why I say to come back here, and we both have the apartment. I'm telling you, Biff, any babe you want. Now, with a ranch, I could do the work I like and still be something. I just wonder, though, I wonder if Oliver still thinks I stole that carton of basketballs. Oh, he probably forgot that long ago. It's almost ten years. You're too sensitive. Anyway, he didn't really fire you. Well, I think he was going to. I think that's why I quit. I was never sure what... Whether he knew he thought the world of me, though. I was the only one he'd let lock up the place. Billy, below. You gonna wash the engine, Biff? Shh. Biff looks at Happy, who is gazing down, listening. Willie is mumbling in the parlor. You hear that? They listen. Willie laughs warmly. Biff, growing angry. Doesn't he know Mom can hear that? Don't get your sweater dirty, Biff. A look of pain crosses Biff's face. Oh, oh Willie, that's my dad. Willie, don't get your sweater dirty, Biff. Uh, look of pain crosses Biff's face. Happy. Isn't that terrible? Don't leave again, will you? You'll find a job here. you got to stick around. I don't know what to do with him. It's getting embarrassing. What a simonizing job. Mom's hearing that. No kidding, Biff. You got a date? Wonderful. Happy. Go on to sleep, but talk to him in the morning, will you? Biff, reluctantly getting into bed. With her in the house? Brother. Hmm. Happy getting into bed. I wish you'd have a good talk with him. The light on the room begins to fade. Biff, to himself in bed. That selfish, stupid, happy, shh, sleep, Biff. Their light is up. Well before they have finished speaking, Willie's form is dimly seen below in the darkened kitchen. He opens the refrigerator, searches in there, and takes out a bottle of milk. The apartment houses are fading out, and the entire house and surroundings become covered with leaves. Music insinuates itself as the leaves appear. Willie. Just, just want to be careful with those girls, Biff. That's all. Don't make any promises. No promises of any kind. <clears throat> because a girl, you know, they'll tell them. And you're very young, Biff. You're too young to be talking seriously to girls. Light rises is on the kitchen. Willie, talking, shuts the refrigerator door and comes downstairs to the kitchen table. He pours milk into a glass. He's totally immersed in himself, smiling faintly. Too young entirely, Biff. You want to watch your schooling first. Then, when you're all set, there'll be plenty of girls for a boy like you. He smiles broadly at a kitchen chair. That's so? The girls pay for you? He laughs. Boy, you must really uh, be making a hit. 
Lily is gradually addressing, physically, a point off stage, speaking through the wall of the kitchen, and his voice has been rising in volume to that of a normal conversation. I've been wondering why you paused the car so careful. Ha! Don't leave the hubcaps, boys. Get the chamois to the hubcaps. Happy? Use newspaper on the windows. It's the easiest thing. Show him how to do it, Biff. You see it, Happy? Pat it up. Use it like a pad. That's it. That's it. Good work. You're doing all right, Hap. He pauses, then nods in approbation for a few seconds, then looks upward. Biff, first thing we got to do when we get time is clean that big branch over the house. I'm afraid it's going to fall in a storm and hit the roof. Tell you what, we get a rope, we sling her around, then we climb up there with a couple of saws and take her down. Soon, as you finish the car, boys, I want to see you. I got a surprise for you, boys. Biff, off stage. What you got, Dad? Willie, no, you finished first. Never leave a job till you're finished. Looking toward the big trees. Biff, up in, looking up, looking toward the big trees. Biff, up in Albany. I saw it right between those two. Wouldn't that be something? Just swing in there. Be. Young Happy appear from the direction of Willie with the dressing. Happy carries rags and a pail of water. Biff, wearing a sweater with a block S, carries a football. Biff, pointing in the direction of the car, offstage. How's that, Pop? Professional? Willie, terrific, terrific job, boys. Good work, Biff. Happy, what's the surprise, Pop? Willie, in the back seat of the car. Happy, boy! He runs off. Oh, Biff, what is it, Dad? Tell me, what'd you buy? Willie, laughing, cuffs him. Never mind, something I want you to have. Biff turns and starts off. What is it, Hap? Happy, offstage. It's a punching bag. Biff, oh, Pop! Willie, it's got Gene Tiny's signature on it. Happy runs on stage with the punching bag. Biff, gee, how'd you know we wanted a punching bag? Willie, well, it's the finest thing for the timing. Happy lies down on his back and pedals with his feet. I'm losing weight, you notice, Pop? Willie to Happy. Jumping rope is good for that. Biff. Did you see the new football I got? Willie, examining the ball. Where'd you get the new ball? Biff. The coach told me to practice my passing. Willie. That's so? He gave me the ball, eh? Well, I borrowed it from the locker room. He laughs, laughs confidentially. Willie, laughing with him at the theft. I want you to return that. Happy. I told you he wouldn't like it. Biff, angrily. Well, I'm bringing it back. Willie, stopping the incipient argument to Happy. Sure, he's got to practice with a regulation ball, doesn't he? To Biff. Coach will probably congratulate you on your initiative. Biff. Oh, he keeps congratulating my initiative all the time, Pop. Willie, that's because he likes you. If somebody else took that ball, there'd be an uproar. So what's the report, boys? What's the report? Biff, where'd you go this time, Dad? Gee, we were lonesome for you. Willie, please, puts his hand around each boy, and they come down to the apron. Lonesome, eh? Biff, missed you every minute. Willie, don't say Tell you a secret, boys. Don't breathe it to a soul. Someday, I'll have my own business, and I'll never have to leave home anymore. Like Uncle Charlie, eh? Bigger than Uncle Charlie, because Charlie is not liked. He's liked, but he's not well-liked. Where'd you go this time, Dad? Well, I got on the road, and I went north to Providence. Met the mayor. The mayor of Providence? He was sitting in the hotel lobby. What'd he say? He said, morning. And I said, you got a fine city here, Mayor. And then he had coffee with me. And then I went to Waterbury. Waterbury is a fine city. Big clock city. The famous Waterbury clock. Sold a nice bill there. And then Boston. Boston is the cradle of the revolution. A fine city. And a couple of other towns in Mass. Massachusetts? And on to Portland and Bangor and straight home. Gee, I'd love to go with you sometime, Dad. Soon as summer comes. Promise? 
you and Hap and I, I'll show you all the towns. America is full of beautiful towns and fine, upstanding people. And they know me, boys. They know me up and down New England, the finest people. When I bring you fellas up, they'll be open sesame for all of us. Because one thing, boys, I have friends. I can park my car in any street in New England. My cops protect it like their own. This summer, eh? Safe and happy together? Yeah, yeah, you bet. <clears throat> we'll take our bathing suits. Carry your bags, Pop. Oh, won't that be something? Me coming into the Boston stores with you boys carrying my bags? What a sensation. Beef is prancing around. Practicing passing the ball. Willie. You nervous, Biff, about the game? Not if you're the guy to be there. What do you say? Uh, what do they say about you in school now that they made you captain? Oh, that was Willie. Happy. He's a crowd of girls behind him. <laughs> There's a crowd of girls behind him every time the class change. The classes change. Biff, taking Willie's hand. This Saturday, Pop? This Saturday, just for you, I'm going to break through for a touchdown. You're supposed to pass. I'm taking one play for Pop. You watch me, Pop. And when I take off my helmet, that means I'm breaking out. Then you watch me crash through that line. Willie kisses Biff. Oh, wait till I tell this in Boston. Bernard enters in knickers. He's younger than Biff, earnest and loyal, a worried boy. Biff, where are you? You're supposed to study with me today. Willie. Hey, look at Bernard. What are you looking so anemic about, Bernard? Bernard. He's got to study, Uncle Willie. He's got regents next week. Happy, tauntingly, spinning Bernard around. Let's box, Bernard. Bernard. Biff. He gets away from Happy. Listen, Biff. I heard Mr. Birnbaum saying that if you don't start studying math, he's going to flunk you, and you won't graduate. I heard him. Willie. You better study with him, Biff. Go ahead now. I heard him, Bernard said. Oh, Pop, you didn't see my sneakers. He holds up a foot for Willie to look at, said Biff. Yes. Hey, that's a beautiful job of printing, said Willie. Bernard, wiping his glasses. Just because he printed University of Virginia on his sneakers doesn't mean they've got to graduate him, Uncle Willie. <laughs> Willie, angrily. What are you talking about? With scholarships to three universities, they're going to flunk him? But I heard Mr. Birnbaum say, said Bernard. Don't be a pest, Bernard, Willie replied to his boys. What an anemic. Okay, I'm waiting for you in my house, Biff, said Bernard. Bernard goes off. The Lumens left. <clears throat> Bernard is not well liked, is he? asked Willie. He's liked, but he's not well liked, <laughs> responded Biff. That's right, Pop, <laughs> chimed in Happy. That's just what I mean. Bernard can get the best of marks in school, you understand? But when he gets out in the business world, you understand? You are going to be five times ahead of him. That's why I thank Almighty God you're both built like Aidenesses. Because the man who makes an appearance in the business world, the man who creates personal interest, is the man who gets ahead. Be liked, and you'll never want. You take me, for instance. I never have to wait in line to see a buyer. Willie Loman is here. That's all they have to know, and I go right through. Did you knock him dead, Pop? Asked Biff. Knocked him cold in Providence, slaughtered him in Boston. Happy, on his back, pedaling again. I'm losing weight. You notice, Pop? Linda enters, as of old, a ribbon in her hair, carrying a basket of washing. Linda, with youthful energy. Hello, dear. Sweetheart. How's the Chevy run? Chevrolet, Linda, is the greatest car ever built. To the boys. Since when do you let your mother carry wash up the stairs? Grab hold there, boy, said Biff. Where's you, Mom? asked Happy. Hang on the line, and you better go down to your friends, Biff. The cellar is full of boys. They don't know what to do with themselves. Uh, when Pop comes home, they can wait, said Biff. Uh, Willie laughs appreciatively. You better go down and tell them what to do, Biff. I think I'll have them sweep out the furnace room. Good work, Biff, said Willie. 
Biff goes through wall line of kitchen to doorway at back and calls down. Fellas, everybody sweep out the furnace room. I'll be right down. Voices. All right. Okay, Biff. George and Sam and Frank come out back. We're hanging up the wash. Come on, Hap, on the double. He and Happy carry out the basket. Linda. The way they obey him. Well, that's trading. The trading, I'm telling you. I was selling thousands and thousands, but I had to come home. Oh, the whole block will be at the game. Did you sell anything? I did 500 gross in Providence and 700 gross in Boston. No! Wait a minute. I've got a pencil. She pulls pencil and paper out of her apron pocket. That makes your commission... 200 My goodness! $212! Well, I didn't figure it yet, but... How much did you do? Well, I... I did... About 180 gross in Providence. Well, no, it came to roughly 200 gross on the whole trip. Linda, without hesitation. 200 gross, that she figures. Willie, the trouble was that three of the stores were half closed for inventory in Boston. Otherwise, I would have broke records. Well, it makes $70 and some pennies. That's very good. What do we owe? Well, on the first, there's $16 on the refrigerator. Why 16 well, the fan belt broke, so it was a dollar eighty. What is it brand new? Well, the man said that's the way it is. Till they work themselves in, you know. They moved through the wall line into the kitchen. I hope we don't get stuck on that machine, said Willie. They got the biggest ads of any of them, said Linda. I know it's a fine machine. What else, said Willie? Well, there's nine sixty for the washing machine, and for the vacuum cleaner, there's three and a half due on the fifteenth. And the roof, you got $21 remaining. It doesn't leak, does it? asked Willie. No, they did a wonderful job. Then you owe Frank for the carburetor. I'm not going to pay that man. The, that terrible Chevrolet. They ought to prohibit the manufacturer of that car. Well, you owe him three and a half. And odds and ends come to around uh, $120 by the 15th. $120? My goodness, if business doesn't pick up, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, next week you'll do better. Oh, I'll knock him dead next week. I'll go to Hartford. I'm very well liked in Hartford. You know, the trouble is, Linda, people don't seem to take me. They move on to the fourth stage. <laughs> oh, don't be foolish. I know it when I walk in. They seem to laugh at me. Why? Why would they laugh at you? Don't talk that way, Willie. Why? Why would they laugh at you? Don't talk that way, Willie. Willie moves to the edge of the stage. Linda goes into the kitchen and starts starts to darn stalking. I don't know the reason for it, but they just passed me by. I'm not noticed. But you're doing wonderful, dear. You're making seventy to a hundred dollars a week. But I gotta be at it ten, twelve hours a day. Other men, I don't know, they do it easier. I don't know why. I can't stop myself. I talk too much. A man ought to come in with a few words. One thing about Charlie, he's a man of few words, and they respect him. You don't talk too much. You're just lively. Willie smiling. Well, I figure, what the heck? Life is short. A couple of jokes. To himself. I joke too much. The smile goes. Why, you're... I'm fat. I'm very foolish to look at it, Linda. I didn't tell you, but Christmas time, I happened to be calling on F.H. Stewart and a salesman I know. As I was going in to see the buyer, I heard him say something about walrus, and I, I cracked him right across the face. I won't take that. I simply will not take that, but they do laugh at me. I know that. Darling. I got to overcome it. I know I got to overcome it. I'm not dressing to advantage, maybe. Willie, darling, you're the handsomest man in the world. Oh, no, Linda. To me, you are the handsomest. From the darkness is heard the laughter of a woman. Willie doesn't turn to it, but it continues through Linda's lines. Huh. From the darkness is heard the laughter of a woman. Willie doesn't turn to it, but it continues through Linda's lines. 
And the boys, Willie, few men are idolized by their children the way you are. Music is heard as behind a scrim to the left of the house, the woman, dimly seen, is dressing. Willie, with great feeling. You're the best there is, Linda. You're a pal. You know that? On the road. On the road, I want to grab you sometimes and just kiss the life out of you. The laughter is loud now, and he moves into a brightening area at the left, where the woman has come from behind the screen and is standing, putting on her hat, looking into a mirror, and laughing. Because I get so lonely, especially when business is bad and there's nobody to talk to. I get the feeling that I'll never sell anything again, that I won't make make a living for you or a business or a business for the boys. He talks through the woman's subsiding laughter. The woman primps at the mirror. There's so much I want to make for me. You didn't make me, Willie. I picked you. Willie, please. You picked me? The woman, who is quite proper looking, Willie's age. Oh, the woman. Me? You, you didn't make me, Willie. I picked you. Willie, because I have a special mirror. The woman has a mirror. There's so much I want to make for me. You didn't make me, Willie. I picked you. The woman, who is quite proper looking, Willie's age. I did. I've been sitting at the desk, watching all the salesmen go by, day in, day out. Sense of humor. And, and we do have such a good time together, don't we? Willie. Sure, sure. He takes her in. The woman. It's two o'clock. Willie. No, come on in. He pulls her. The woman. My sisters will be scandalized. When, when will you be back? Willie, oh, two weeks about. Will you come up and sure thing? It's good for me. She squeezes his arm. I think you're a wonderful man. You picked me, eh? The woman, sure, because you're so sweet and such a kidder. Willie, well, I'll see you next time I'm in Boston. The woman, I'll put you right through to the buyers. Willie slapping her bottom. Right. Well, bottom's up. The woman slaps him gently and laughs. You just killed me, Willie. He suddenly grabs her and kisses her roughly. You kill me. And thanks for the stockings. I love a lot of stockings. Well, good night. Good night and keep your pores open. The woman. Oh, Willie. The woman bursts out laughing and Linda's laughter blends in. The woman disappears into the dark. Now the area at the kitchen table brightens. Linda is sitting where she was at the kitchen table, but now is mending a pair of her silk stockings. Linda, you are, Willie, the handsomest man. You've got no reason to feel that. Willie, coming out of the woman's dimming area and going over. I'll make it all up to you, Linda. I'll. There's nothing to make up, dear. You're doing fine. Better than Willie, noticing her mending. What's that? Just mending my stockings. They're so expensive. Willie angrily taking them from her. I won't have you mending stockings in this house. Now throw them out. Linda puts the stockings in her pocket. Bernard entering on the run. Where is he if he doesn't study? Willie moving to the fourth stage with great agitation. You'll give him the answers. Bernard. I do, but I can't on a regents. That's a state exam. They're liable to arrest me. Willie. Where is he? A whip him. A whip him. Linda, and he better give back that football, Willie. It's not nice. Willie, Biff, where is he? Why is he taking everything? Linda, he's too rough with the girls, Willie. All the mothers are afraid of him. Willie, I'll whip him. Bernard, he's driving the car without a license. Oh, the woman's laugh is heard. Willie, shut up. Linda, all the mothers, Willie, shut up. Bernard, backing quietly away and out. Mr. Birnbaum says he's stuck up. Backing quietly away and out, Mr. Birnbaum says he's stuck up. Willie, get out of here. Bernard, if he doesn't buckle down, he'll flunk math. He goes off. Linda, he's all right. Linda, he's all right, Willie. You've got Willie exploding at her. There's nothing the matter with him. You want him to be a worm like Bernard? He's got spirit, personality. As he speaks, Linda, almost in tears, exits into the living room. Willie is alone in the kitchen, wilting and staring. 
The leaves are gone. It's night again, and the apartment houses look down from behind. Willie, loaded with it. Loaded. What is he stealing? He's giving it back, isn't he? Why is he stealing? What did I tell him? I never in my life told him anything but decent things. Happy in pajamas has come down the stairs. Willie suddenly becomes aware of Happy's presence. Happy, let's go now. Come on. Willie, sitting down at the kitchen table. Huh? Why does she have to wax the floors herself? Every time she waxes the floor, she kneels over. She knows that. Happy, shh, take it easy. What brought you back today? Willie. I got an awful scare. Nearly hit a kid in Yonkers. God, why didn't I go to Alaska with my brother Ben that time? Ben, that man was a genius. That man was success incarnate. What a mistake. He begged me to go. Well, there's no use in. You guys. There was a man started with the clothes on his back and ended up with diamond mines. Uh, happy. Boy, someday I'd like to know how he did it. Willie. Uh, what's the mystery? The man knew what he wanted and went out and got it. Walked into a jungle and comes out the age of 21 and he's rich. The world is an oyster, but you don't crack it open on a mattress. Happy. Oh, I told you I'm going to retire you for life. Willie. You'll retire me for life on 70 goddamn dollars a week? And your woman and your car and your apartment? And you'll retire me for life? Christ's sake. I couldn't get past Yonkers today. Where are you guys? Where are you? The wood have a car. Charlie has appeared in the doorway. He's a large man, slow of speech, laconic, immovable. In all he says, despite what he says, there is pity and now trepidation. He has a robe over pajamas, slippers on his feet. He enters the kitchen. Everything all right? Happy. Yeah, Charlie. Everything. Willie. What's the matter? Charlie. I heard some noise. I thought something happened. Can't we do something about the walls? You sneeze in here, and in my house, hats blow off. <laughs> I heard some noise. I thought something happened. Can we do something about the walls? You sneeze in here, and my... And in my... Wait, let's go to bed, Dad. Come on. Charlie signals to Happy to go. Willie. You go ahead. I'm not tired at the moment. Willie. Happy to Willie. Take it easy, huh? He exits. Willie, what are you doing up? Charlie, sitting down at the table opposite Willie. Couldn't sleep good. I had a heartburn. Willie, well, you don't know how to eat. Charlie, I eat with my mouth. Willie, no, you're ignorant. you got to know about vitamins and things like that. Charlie, come on, let's shoot. Tear you out a little. Willie, hesitantly, all right, you got cards? Charlie, taking a deck from his pocket. Yeah, I got them someplace. Uh, what is it with those vitamins? Willie, dealing. They build up your bones. Chemistry, Charlie. But there's no bones in a heartburn. <laughs> what are you talking about? Do you know the first thing about it? Don't get insulted. Don't talk about something you don't know anything about. They're playing. Pause. Charlie. What are you doing home? Willie. A little trouble with the car. Oh. I'd like to take a trip to California. Don't say. You want a job? I got a job. I told you that. After a slight pause. What the hell are you offering me a job for? Don't get insulted. Don't insult me. I don't see no sense in it. You don't have to go on this way. I got a good job. What do you keep coming in here for? You want me to go? After a pause, withering, Willie. Really. I can't understand it. He's going back to Texas again. What the heck is that? Let him go. I got nothing to give Charlie. I'm clean. I'm clean. He won't starve. None of them starve. Forget about him. Then what have I got to remember? You take it too hard. To heck with it. When a deposit bottle is broken, you don't get your nickel back. That's easy enough for you to say. That ain't easy for me to say. Did you see the ceiling I put up in the living room? Yeah, that's a piece of work. To put up a ceiling is a mystery to me. How do you do it? What's the difference? Well, I'll talk about it. You're going to put up a ceiling? How could I put up a ceiling? Then what the heck are you bothering me for? You're insulted again. A man who can't handle tools is not a man. You're disgusting. 
Don't call me disgusting, Willie. Uncle Ben, carrying a valis and an umbrella, enters the fourth stage from around the right corner of the house. He's a stolid man in his 60s with a mustache and authoritative air. He's utterly certain of his destiny, and there is an aura of far places about him. He enters exactly as Willie speaks. I'm getting awfully tired, Ben. Ben's music is heard. Ben looks around at everything. Good, keep playing. You'll sleep better. Did you call me, Ben? Ben looks at his watch. Willie, that's funny. For a second there, you reminded me of my brother, Ben. I only have a few minutes. He strolls, inspecting the place. Willie and Charlie continue playing. You never heard from him again, hey? Since that time? Willie, didn't Linda tell you? A couple of weeks ago, he got a letter from his wife in Africa. He died. Charlie, that so? Ben, chuckling. So this is Brooklyn, eh? Charlie, maybe you're in for some of his money. Willie? Nah, he had seven sons. There's just one opportunity I had with that man. Ben. I must take a train, William. There are several properties I'm looking at in Alaska. Willie. Sure, sure. If I'd gone with him to Alaska that time, everything would have been totally different. Charlie, go on. You'd froze to death up there. What are you talking about? Opportunity is tremendous in Alaska, William. Surprised you're not up there, said Ben. Sure, tremendous, said Willie. Huh? Willie, there was the only man I ever I, I ever met who knew the answers. Charlie, who? Ben, how are you all? Willie, taking a pot, smiling. Fine, fine. Charlie, pretty sharp tonight. Ben, is Mother living with you? Willie, oh, she died a long time ago. Charlie, who? Ben, that's too bad. Fine specimen of a lady, Mother. Willie, to Charlie. Huh? Ben. I'd hope to see the old girl, Charlie. Who died? Ben. Heard anything from father, have you? Billy, unnerved. What do you mean? Who died? Charlie taking... What do you mean, who died? Charlie taking a pot. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Ben, looking at his watch. William, it's half past eight. Willie, as though to dispel the confusion, he angrily stops Charlie's hand. That's my bill. Charlie, I put the ass of... Billy, if you don't know how to play the game, I'm not going to throw my money away on you. Charlie, rising. It was my ace. Oh, I put the ace. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's my deal. Charlie, I put the ace. Willie, if you don't know how to play the game, I'm not going to throw my money away on you. Charlie, rising. It was my ace, for goodness sake. Willie, I'm through. I'm through. Then, when did mother die? Willie, long ago. Since the beginning, you never knew how to play cards. Charlie picks up the cards and goes to the door. All right, next time I'll bring a deck with five aces. Willie, I don't play that kind of game. Charlie turning to him. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Yeah? Yeah. Charlie leaves. Willie slamming the door after him. Ignore Amos. Ignore Amos. Then, as Willie comes toward him through the wall line of the kitchen. So you're William. Willie, shaking Ben's hand. Ben, I've been waiting for you so long. What's the answer? How did you do it? Ben, oh, there's a story in that. Linda enters the fourth stage, as of old, carrying the wash basket. Linda, is this Ben? Ben, gallantly. How do you do, my dear? Linda, where have you been all these years? Willie's always wondered why you, Willie, pulling Ben away from her impatiently. Where's Dad? Didn't you follow him? How did you get started? Ben, well, I don't know how much you remember. Willie, well, I was just a baby, of course, only three or four years old. Ben, three years and 11 months. Willie, what a memory, Ben. Ben, I have many enterprises, William, and I have never kept books. Willie, I remember, I was sitting in the wagon in, was it Nebraska? It was South Dakota, and I gave you a bunch of wildflowers, replied Ben. I remember you walking away down some open road, said Willie. Ben laughing. I was going to find father in Alaska. Where is he? asked Ben. At the age I had a very faulty view in geography, William. I discovered after a few days that I was heading due south. So instead of Alaska, I ended up in Africa. Africa? As exclaimed Linda. Willie. The Gold Coast. Ben. Principally diamond mines. Linda. Diamond mines. 
Ben, yes, my dear, but I've only a few minutes. Willie, no, boys, boys, young Biff and Happy up here. Listen to this. This is your Uncle Ben, a great man. Tell me, my boys, or tell my boys, Ben. Uh, ben says, why, boys, when I was 17, I walked into the jungle, and when I was 21, I walked out. He left, and by goodness, I was rich. Willie, to the boys. You see what I've been talking about? The greatest things that can can happen. Ben, glancing at his watch, I have an appointment in Ketchikan Tuesday week. Willie, no, Ben, please tell about Dad. I want my boys. No, Ben, please tell about Dad, Grandfather. I want my boys to hear about the Grandfather. I want them to know the kind of stock they spring from. I'll remember the man with the big beard, and I was in Mama's lap, sitting around a fire, and some kind of high music. His flute. He played the flute. Sure, the flute. That's right, said Willie. New music is heard. A high, rollicking tune. Ben. Father was a very great and a very wild-hearted man. He would start in Boston, and he tossed the whole family into the wagons, and then he'd drive the team right across the country, through Ohio and Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, and all the western states. And we'd stop in the towns and sell the flutes that we made on the way. Great inventor, Father. With one gadget, he made more in a week than a man like you could make in a lifetime. That's just the way I'm bringing them up, Ben. Rugged, well liked, all around. Well liked, all around. Yeah? Tip Biff. Hit that boy, hard as you can. He pounds his stomach. Oh no, sir, replies Biff. Ben, taking boxing stance. Come on, get to me, he laughs. Billy. Willie, go to it, Biff. Go ahead, show him. Biff, okay, he cocks his fist and starts in. Linda to Willie, why must he fight, dear? Ben, sparring with Biff. Good boy, good boy. Willie, how's that, Ben? Heh, happy. Give him the left, Biff. Linda, why are you fighting? Ben, good boy. Suddenly comes in, trips Biff, and stands over him, and points... The point of his umbrella poised over Biff's eye. Linda, look out, Biff! Biff, gee! Then, patting Biff's knee, never fight fair with a stranger, boy. You'll never get out of the jungle that way. Taking Linda's hand and bowing it. It was an honor and a pleasure to meet you, Linda. Linda, withdrawing her hand coldly, frightened. Have a nice trip. Then, to Willie. And good luck with your, what do you do? Willie, selling. Yes, yes, he raises his hand in farewell to all. No, Ben, I don't want you to think. He takes Ben's arms to show him. It's Brooklyn, I know, but we hunt too. Really now, said Ben. Willie, well, I'm sure there's snakes and rabbits, and that's why I moved out here. Why Biff can fell any one of these trees in no time. Boys, go right over to where they're building the apartment house and get some sand. We're going to rebuild the entire front stoop right now. Watch. Yes, sir. On the double. Ha. Happy as he and Biff run off. I lost weight, Pop. You notice? Charlie enters in knickers, even before the boys are gone. Charlie. Listen, if they steal any more from that building, the watchman will put the cost on them. Linda to Willie. Don't let Biff. Ben laughs lustily. Willie. You should have seen the lumber they brought home last week. At least a dozen six by tens worth of all kinds of money. Charlie. Listen, if that watchman... Willie, I gave them heck, understand, but I've got a couple of fearless characters there. Charlie. Willie, the jails are full of fearless characters. Ben, clapping Willie on the back with a laugh at Charlie and the stock exchange, uh, with a laugh at Charlie, and the stock exchange, friend. Willie, joining in Ben's laughter. Where are the rest of your pants? Charlie, my wife bought them. Willie, now all you need is a golf club, and you can go upstairs and go to sleep. To Ben, great athlete. Between him and his son Bernard, they can't hammer a nail. Bernard rushing in. The watchman's chasing Biff. Willie, angrily, shut up. He's not stealing anything. Linda, alarmed, hurrying off left. Where is he? Biff, dear, she exits. Willie, moving toward the left, away from Ben. There's nothing wrong. What's the matter with you? Willie. 
moving toward the left, away from Ben. Uh, ben, nervy boy, good. Lily laughing, oh, nerves of iron, that bit. Charlie, don't know what it is. My New England man comes back and he's bleeding. They murdered him up there. Willie, it contacts Charlie. I got important contacts. Charlie, sarcastically, glad to hear it, Willie. Come in later. We'll shoot a little casino. I'll take some of your Portland money. He laughs at Willie and I said, Willie turns to Ben. Business is bad. It's murderous. But not for me, of course. Ben, I'll stop by on my way to Africa. Willie, longingly. Can't you stay a few days? You're just what I need, Ben, because I, I have a fine position here, but I, well, Dad left when I was such a baby, and I never had a chance to talk to him, and I still feel kind of temporary about him. I'll be late for my train. They're at opposite ends of the stage. Willie. Ben, my boys, can't we talk? Ben, my boys, can't we talk? They'd go into the jaws of heck for hell for me. See, I, you're being first rate with your boys. Outstanding, manly chaps. Willie, hanging on to his words. Oh, Ben, that's good to hear because sometimes I'm afraid that I'm not teaching them the right kind of... Ben, how should I teach them? Ben, giving great weight to each word and with a certain vicious audacity. William, when I walked into the jungle, I was 17. When I walked out, I was 21, and, by goodness, I was rich. He goes off into the darkness around the right corner of the house. Willie, Willie, was rich. That's just the spirit I want to imbue with them, to walk into a jungle. I was right. I was right. I was right. Ben is gone, but Willie is still speaking to him as Linda, in nightgown and robe, enters the kitchen, glances around for Willie, then goes to the door of the house, looks out and... Down to his left, he looks at her. Willie, dear, Willie, I was right. Did you have some cheese? He can't answer. It's very late. It's very late, darling. Come back to bed, hey? Willie, looking straight up. Try to break your neck to see a star in this yard. You coming in? Whatever happened to that diamond watch, Bob? Remember when Ben came from Africa that time? Didn't he give me a watch, Bob, with a diamond in it? You pawned it, dear, 12, 13 years ago for Biff's radio correspondence course. Gee, that was a beautiful thing. I'll take a walk. But you're in slippers. Willie, starting to go around the house at the left. I was right. I was. Half to Linda as he goes, shaking his head. What a man. What a man worth talking to. I was right. Linda, calling after Willie. But in your slippers, Willie... Willie is almost gone when Biff, in his pajamas, comes down the stairs and enters the kitchen. What is he doing out there? Shh, hey, Mom. How long has he been doing this? Don't. He'll hear you. What's the... What the heck is the matter with him? It'll pass by morning. Shouldn't we do anything? Oh, my dear, you should do a lot of things, but there's nothing to do, so go to sleep. Happy comes down the stairs and sits on the steps. I never heard him so loud, Mom. Well, come around more often. You'll hear him. She sits down at the table and mends the lining of Willie's jacket. Why didn't you ever write me about this, Mom? Asks Biff. Linda replies, How would I write you? For over three months, you had no address. I was on the move, but you know, I thought of you. You know that, don't you, pal? I know, dear. I know. He likes to have a letter. Just to know that there's Still a possibility for th for better things. He's not like this all the time, is he? It's when you come home, he's always the worst. When I come home? Asked Biff. When you write your coming, he's all smiles and talks about the future, and he's just wonderful. But then the closer you see him to come, the more shaky he gets. And then, by the time you get here, he's arguing, and he seems angry at you. I think it's just that maybe he can't bring himself to, to open up to you. Why are you so hateful to each other? Why is that? Biff, basically, I'm not hateful, Mom. Linda, but you no sooner come in the door than you're fighting. I don't know why. I mean to change. I'm trying, Mom. You understand. Are you home to stay now? I don't know. I want to look around, see what's doing. Biff, you can't look around all your life, can you? I just can't take hold, Mom. I just can't 
take hold of some kind of life. Biff, a man is not a bird to come and go with the springtime. Your hair. He touches her hair. Your hair got so gray. Oh, it's been going gray since you were in high school. I just stopped dyeing it, that's all. Dye it again, will ya? I don't want to see my pal look at old. He smiles. You're such a boy. You think you can go away for a year and... You've got to get it into your head now that one day you'll knock on this door and there'll be a, and there'll be strange people here. What are you talking about? You're not even 60, Mom. But what about your father? Biff, lamely. Well, I meant him too. Happy. He admires Pop. Linda. Biff, dear, if you don't have any feeling for him, then you can't have any feeling for me. Biff. Sure I can, Mom. Linda. No, you can't just come to see me because I love him. With a threat, but only a threat of tears. He's the dearest man in the world to me, and I won't have anyone making him feel unwanted, low, and blue. You've got to make up your mind now, darling. There's no leeway anymore. Either he's your father and you pay him that respect, or else you not come here. Uh, I know he's not easy to get along with. Nobody knows that better than me, but... Willie from the left with a laugh. Hey, hey, Biffo! Biff starting to go out after Willie. What the heck is the matter with him? Happy stops him. Linda. Don't. Don't go near him. Biff. Stop making excuses for him. He always, always wet the floor with you. Never had an ounce of respect for you. He's always had respect. Happy. He's always had respect for it. Biff. What the heck do you know about it? Happy. Surely. Just don't call him crazy. Biff. He's got no character. Charlie wouldn't do this. Not in his own house. Spewing out that vomit from his mind. Happy. Charlie never had to cope with what he's got to. People are worse off than Willie Loman. Believe me. I've seen them, said Biff. Linda. Then make Charlie your father, Biff. You can't do that. Can you? I don't say he's a great man. Willie Loman never made a lot of money. His name was never in the paper. He's not the finest character that ever lived, but he's a human being, and a terrible thing is happening to him, so attention must be paid. He's not to be allowed to fall into his grave like an old dog. Attention. Attention must be finally paid to such a person. You called him crazy. I didn't mean, said Ben. No, a lot of people... Thank you.